Vauxhall needs more of a competitive presence in the industry's fastest growing segment, that for small trendy SUVs. And courtesy of PSA Engineering, this second generation Mocha model provides it. There's nothing that changes the class norm here, but we can't remember a more visually appealing Vauxhall in recent memory. Welcome to the fresh new face of Vauxhall, showcased here by the trendy so-called Vauxhall visor look of this second generation Mocha SUV. You might remember the Mocha, it was one of the earlier small crossovers, first introduced in 2012 and then updated and relaunched as the Mocha X in 2016. That early Korean built design was, to be frank, a pretty mediocre convection, but it was an important model for Vauxhall dealers to have in their showrooms and it actually sold pretty well. Over 200,000 examples have found UK customers by the time sales petered out in 2019 as the Mocha's place in the range became squeezed between the smaller Crossland X and the larger Grandland X. Like those two cars, but unlike the original Mocha, this completely different Mark II design is based on engineering and a platform structure that's borrowed from fellow Stellantis Group brands, specifically the French ones. Uh, the latest CMP platform in this case, which means it's basically the same underneath as a Mark II Peugeot 2008 or a DS3 Crossback. And that in turn means there's also a full electric version, the Mocha E. And we've chosen to test that variant here. That chassis structure is a good deal more modern than the old PF1 underpinnings that are still sported by Vauxhall's other small SUV in this segment. The fractionally larger, fractionally cheaper, but also quite a lot less fashionable Crossland model. It'll certainly be looks that'll sell this rejuvenated Mocha. In fact, we're struggling to think of a previous Vauxhall model with quite as much pavement presence as this one has but is there substance as well as style here? You'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, car and driving's road test, to find that out. It used to be the case that the segment for small crossovers was one to steer well clear of if you wanted a car that was fun to drive. The sector's general dynamic dullness was typified by the original version of the Vauxhall Mocha, a car with handling which was about as engaging as a trip to the dentist. Things have thankfully moved on a bit since then though, with a much higher bar being set in this class by models like the second generation Nissan Duke and most notably by Ford's Puma. The styling of this Mark II Mocha suggests that it might have set out to meet this newfound class standard, as does the subtle repositioning of the Vauxhall brand by new owner Stellantis and a 30 kilogram weight advantage over the Puma. But underneath all the jaunty panel work, everything here is pretty much the same as with two segment rivals not especially known for their dynamic drive, uh, Peugeot's 2008 and the DS3 Crossback. That Vauxhall's engineers wanted to create a slightly sportier convection is evidenced here by the slightly firmer ride you'll notice in the first half mile of driving this car, but it seems that there wasn't really the time, the money or the inclination to finish the job because the close body control, the poise at speed and the responsive steering that this mocker would need to fully rival the Puma or even the Duke are missing here. Still, the fashionista target market for this car probably won't care very much about that. And what we do have is, of course, a massive improvement on the first generation Mocha model. And perhaps more relevantly, on this car's small SUV showroom stablemate, the Crossland, which rides on the more elderly PF1 underpinnings, which are shared with the Citroen C3 Aircross. The Mocha's new generation CMP platform provides a next level standard of engineering which is a decent step forward from cars like that and you'll notice this in the way that nasty bumps don't send tremors through the body shell, uh, the fewer creaks and rattles from the stiffer structure and in the better camera safety provision on offer. Maybe also in the way that better body control allows you to precisely place the car exactly where you want it through the corners once you learn to trust this rather light steering and you've got used to the way that it weights up at speed. 
At this point, you're probably going to want to know a bit more about the various powertrain choices, petrol, electric or diesel, which Vauxhall wants you to select between in the same way that you choose a trim level. Uh, we'll get to the experience offered by the all-electric Mocha E version that we're trying here in just a moment, but we'll start with the variants that more customers are likely to want, what Stellantis executives prefer to call the thermic options, internal combustion engine models which are primarily based around the group's usual petrol-powered 1.2 litre turbo unit, since only a tiny percentage of Mocha customers will want to fuel from the black pump. Uh, there's no part electrification of this petrol power plant of the mild hybrid kind that Ford has implemented into the EcoBoost unit that's used in the competing Puma. Uh, this Mocha's three-cylinder engine doesn't quite have the characterful thrum that that rival power plant has either, although it will happily fizz up to the red line if you find yourself running late and you need to gun it a bit. Yes, even in base 100 PS form, where the engine offers up a lovely warble as it goes about its business and gives a decent shove from low revs. It's enough for quite an eager level of performance too from this base power plant uh, that sees 62 dispatched in 10.6 seconds on the way to 116 miles an hour. That 100 PS 1.2 litre turbo unit comes only with a six speed manual transmission, but if you pay the extra for the uprated 130 PS version, you'll be offered the option of eight speed automatic transmission, which comes with steering wheel paddles and a drive mode button on the centre console that offers normal eco and sport settings. Select Sport, uh, it's embellished with sound enhancement on the top SRI Premium and Ultimate models, and you might get somewhere near to the officially quoted performance stats for this uprated unit, which with the auto variant C62 uh, reached in 9.2 seconds en route to 124 miles an hour, it's 9.1 seconds and 125 miles an hour for the manual 130 PS model. We can't really see much of a motivation to pay the significant premium the Vauxhall wants for the only other thermic power plant on offer, a 1.5 litre turbo D diesel offered only with manual transmission, even though the 110 PS unit is class leadingly clean and economical. We suppose it might be more suitable in the unlikely event that you were planning to do something like tow a small caravan behind your mocker, but even in that scenario, uh, you might note that the 1.2 tonne brakes towing capacity of this diesel is no different from that of the turbo petrol unit. The performance figures are very similar too. At 62 miles an hour from rest occupies 10.8 seconds en route to 118 miles an hour. Right, that's covered off those combustion engine powertrain options. Now let's get on to what's on offer from this Mocha E model's full battery powered setup. Here, as with this model's Stellantis Group Cousins, the Peugeot E2008 and the DS3 Crossback e a 50 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery is mated to a 100 kilowatt electric motor, putting out 136 PS and working through the usual single speed auto transmission you get with EVs. Uh, this car doesn't hurl itself away from rest quite as aggressively as some of its segment rivals. Interestingly, the throttle linearity gets more leisurely setting than in the E2008, so it's nearly a second slower than that to 60 miles an hour. As usual with an EV though, the fact that the torque is all developed at once, there's 260 newton meters of it, makes it feel quicker than the official stats suggest. It takes no more than around three seconds to crest the 30 miles an hour mark, and 60 miles an hour is reached in 9.2 seconds. All of this disguises the fact that, as with all EVs, this zero emissions variant has a bit of a weight problem. Uh, that drivetrain adds over 300 kilos of bulk. That other small battery-powered models manage this issue a little better is evidenced by the fact that this Mocha E's WLTP driving range, quoted at up to 209 miles, is easily improved on by other similarly-sized EVs at this price point. A 58 kilowatt hour Volkswagen ID3, for example, can travel up to 260 miles between charges. Those wanting to plug in but get much greater range will be disappointed to learn that this car's CMP platform can't support plug-in hybrid tech, so there's no possibility for a Mocha to take on Renault's Capture PHEV. Still, what we do get with this Mocha E it does represent a brave new world for forward-thinking customers in the compact SUV segment who are looking to make the still rather expensive switch into all-electric motoring. It seems like only yesterday, after all, that a fully charged small EV could only manage around half the kind of range that you get from this one. 
Of course, you certainly won't achieve anything like that kind of operating capability if you get anywhere near to this uh, EV's quoted 93 miles an hour top speed, or if you habitually drive your Mokka E in the sports setting, which will be necessary to release the full 136 PS power output we just mentioned. The quoted range figure will only be distantly possible if you instead engage a somewhat restrictive eco mode, which drops power output right down to 83 PS. And that's a setting uh, that you'll use in your Mokka E around town, an environment where it makes a strange polyphonic sound at low speeds to warn unwary pedestrians of its impending approach. Above 18 miles an hour, all you can hear is a bit of tyre roar from the eco-moulded rubber, but there isn't too much of that at cruising speeds, where the wind noise uh, that you tend to notice more in EVs also seems to have been decently well contained. On twistier roads, you will notice the extra bulk of all those battery cells if you start to throw the car around. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, but as usual with an electric vehicle, the low placement of the battery pack in the chassis helps to mask that downside a bit. Unlike some rivals, there is no uh, setting that allows you to mess around with the regenerative braking and engage in one pedal driving, but you can engage the minimalistic gear selector between the seats into a lower B position that adds a bit of extra regeneration to sew the car a little more off throttle. Overall, whatever blend of Mokka takes your fancy, petrol, diesel or electric, we think you'll find there's plenty to like here. Uh, now, given that this is a small fashion-led SUV, it almost goes without saying that there's no four-wheel drive option anywhere in the range, nor has Vauxhall taken the opportunity to build in the advanced grip control system that you can specify as an option on some combustion-engined Peugeot 2008s. Ultimately though, a typical Mokka customer won't be someone wanting to push tractional boundaries or revel in the improved drive dynamics of this Mark II model. On the contrary, uh, these will often be people who want to have as little input into the road going experience as possible. Now should that be the case, then you'll really like the impressive refinement that's evident even in the combustion engine versions of this Vauxhall. Uh, they make you feel much more comfortable about the prospect of potentially attempting a long highway trip too and for that kind of journey uh, you might also possibly be interested in the limited level 2 style driving autonomy that it is possible to have on the plusher versions of this car with this a combination of adaptive cruise control and a lane positioning assist system mean that on a long highway trip virtually all the steering braking and throttle work will be done for you just another example of the way that the design of compact crossovers has recently moved forward. A sign of the times, you might say, uh, and that's from a Vauxhall, which is very much that. Well, this is different, isn't it? The name may not have changed, but everything else has, not least the way the Mokka looks. Out go the anonymous proportions and bland curves of the previous model. In comes a confident stance with a square-jawed face, sharp lines and interesting details. The Mokka marked the debut of a new design language for Vauxhall and lead designer Mark Adams and his team have made the most of this opportunity to create something genuinely fresh and distinctive drawing from their GTX concept car of 2018 and doing a very good job of differentiating this model from its two closely related Stellantis Group cousins, the Peugeot 2008 and the DS3 Crossback, which both sit on the same platform and roll off the same production line in France. Let's start at the front where the appearance is dominated by the visor grille, which rings the headlamps, the badge and the front panel running between the lights. Now, Vauxhall says that this is a revolutionary front grille, but it's clearly one also created with an item model sold by the brand of the past that the target market here probably won't remember. Uh, are there hints of the HB Vauxhall Viva of the 60s in this front end? Uh, the crease running down the centre of the bonnet here. Uh, meanwhile, that might bring to mind sporty models from the 70s, uh, like the Forenza, the Magnum, maybe even the first generation Opel Manta. Whatever, it all helps the Mokka to stand out against competitors. And if you go for the SRA premium level of trim, the visors, central griffin badge and the lower skid plate both turn black, creating quite a menacing look. 
moving profile and what we've got here is the archetypal modern small crossover all sweeping creases color coded finishing and big wheels a key flourish is this trimming strip that flows uh, above the upper window line normally finished as here in chrome but it's marked out in red on the sri premium model Reminiscent of the pram handle line that featured on the little Vauxhall Adam, its purpose on the mocker is to create a floating roof line and the trick works well in combination with this contrast coloured black roof. Uh, that's a standard feature, providing you avoid entry level trim. Uh, combined with the very short overhangs, the angular C pillar and this crease that flows up through the front door uh, towards the wing, it contributes to the impression that the car's leaning forward. Squat and muscular looking on wheels at between 16 and 18 inches in size. Uh, we've got these 17 inches here and those are housed within chunky wheel arches connected by a section of black trim that runs through the doors. The rear plays a similar styling trick to the front, making the car look wider than it actually is. The slender, sculpted LED taillights play a key role, as does the well-spaced out mocker name that sits above the crease running through the tailgate. There's the usual subtle roof spoiler here and the beasting area just beyond, uh, plus lower down, slim corner reflectors and the usual obligatory silver trim strip to suggest a skid plate. Of course, as usual, what's more important is what you can't see, the sophisticated CMP platform we referenced earlier on. This saves 120 kilos over the previous generation model chassis, but at the same time, it's stiffer thanks to the use of ultra high strength steel, up to 30% stiffer in the case of this EV version, thanks to the integrated battery structure that sits low down. So the exterior has grabbed our attention. Are things as engaging inside the cabin? Let's step inside and find out. Now, if you're switching from the original Mokka, you might think you've skipped a couple of model generations. So different is this cabin. The first thing you'll probably note is what Vauxhall calls the pure panel, a facial design that sees this high mounted central touchscreen and this driver instrument display to the right of it, almost bonded together, angled towards you and giving the impression of a large screen. And everything else is far more sophisticated too, particularly in terms of switch gear and trimming, the shiny piano black lower center console finishing, for example, and the smart white double stitching on the doors. Plus, despite the sporty exterior looks, there's a proper, slightly raised SUV seating position, which gives the more commanding feel that crossover customers like. Not all is quite as nice as it looks, unless you stretch to a mid or upper spec model, the 10 inch central infotainment monitor and the 12 inch instrument display pure panel package that we have here will be replaced uh, by two screens of just seven inches in size, which rather dampens the intended effect. And we'd hope that the front seats would be of the AGR certified sort you get in this car's Crossland SUV showroom stablemate with built-in lumbar support, unfortunately not, although they are six-way adjustable and you get leather upholstery and a massaging function for the driver at the top of the range. Most mockers feature this silvered central fascia trimming panel, but on the sporty SRI premium variant that many will want, the dash also gains bright red lower strips that you'll think uh, either look rather cool or rather garish, depending on your taste in cabin decor. Right, let's take a closer look at this instrument display. It's nothing like as fancy as the 3D setup you'll get in this model's Peugeot 2008 cousin, but it can be satisfyingly customized with various settings, although none of them show you full screen mapping. The main layout's this one, dials that gives you a big circular central gauge, housing a digital speedo flanked by two others. On combustion models, the flanking readouts are a rev counter on the left with temperature and fuel readouts on the right, while on this pure electric Mokka E variant, the flanking gauges give you a power meter on the left and a battery charge percentage dial on the right. If you don't mind a bit of information overload, you can add further to what's on show with various other layout options accessed with a twist of the left hand indicator stalk. All of these, apart from a minimum setting that shows you just the key things you need to know, are based around shrinking the central gauge so that the middle of the screen can also show other things. With the driving setting, you get a safety graphic. With navigation, you get a small mapping display and selecting energy puts an energy flow monitor in your eye line. If you want to drive assistance graphic or trip data info, you can have them separately with the driving or computer layouts or together with the personal setting. 
What about the central screen? If it's of this larger 10 inch sort, it'll be Vauxhall's Multimedia Navi Pro system. Not the most sophisticated monitor we've ever come across, but everything you really need is here. Uh, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, Wi-Fi connectivity, a reasonable quality six speaker DAB audio system, and on this Mocha E, a very useful energy flow monitor. And usually there's no real home screen. Instead, all the functions are controlled by six buttons and a dial underneath, which actually works rather better. These switches connect you directly to audio, nav, phone, car, and connectivity sections, plus another for settings and functions. Tapping the temperature readouts either side of the screen also connect you through to the climate section, but unlike on the Peugeot 2008, or the Citroen C3 Aircross, menu options aren't your only point of access to ventilation functions. Vauxhall doesn't approve of that and provides proper physical controls below the screen, which are very welcome. What else? Uh, well, the flat bottom steering wheel is, as usual on a Vauxhall, rather festooned with what are initially rather confusing little buttons, mainly dealing with safety stuff on the left and audio features on the right. But the wheel has plenty of reach and rake adjustment, which in combination with the height adjustable seat make it easy to get comfortable. We like the minimalistic gear selector fitted to auto models too. As for visibility, well, your frontward view is fine thanks to the narrow A-pillars uh, with their neatly angled integrated speakers, but rearward visibility isn't the best, and that might be a problem with entry-level trim, which has to do without rear parking sensors. And cabin storage, well, as usual with a right-hand drive model of a French-derived small car, the glove box is halved in size by the fuse box. It really is time that Gallic makers sorted that issue out and the designers have forgotten to add an overhead sunglasses compartment too. But you get decently sized door bins with angled bottle holders, twin cup holders, and a small lidded box between the seats. Plus there are ticket clips on the sun visors. Connectivity is reserved for a large storage area at the base of the center stack, which gives you a 12 volt socket and a USB-A port. Let's take a seat in the rear now. Uh, the short rear doors and this small aperture you enter through suggests that it's not going to be particularly spacious back here. And that is pretty much the way it turns out. And unlike in some key rivals or in most mainstream versions of Vauxhall's other small SUV, the Crossland, there's no useful sliding bench mechanism to improve things. Legroom for adults would be okay on a short to medium length journey, but you really wouldn't want to be back here for much longer than that. It will probably be fine for children though, unless they object to the upwardly sloping window line, which, uh, particularly on models with tinted rear windows, might leave some kids feeling a touch claustrophobic. There's no central armrest. The headrests are of the sort that uncomfortably dig into your neck until you raise them. The door bins are small, the middle pew is narrow and a bit raised, and the door cards turn out to be unimaginatively finished in plain black plastic. But there is a relatively low central tunnel, and just above it, youngsters will be pleased to find a couple of central USB-A ports provided. To the loading area now. Uh, now it's frustrating that the button to open it is all the way down here, uh, but after you've clipped that open, you'll get your hands covered with uh, road grime pulling it up, because there's no powered hatch option. With everything open, there's a usefully big aperture, but quite a high lip and a 350 litre capacity figure, which is 60 litres less than you'll get in the Crossland. Uh, to give you some segment perspective, a rival Nissan Duke offers 422 litres, a Ford Puma has 456. Unlike with the Peugeot 2008, you lose out on space if you opt for an all-electric variant. This Mocha E can offer just 310 litres. There is, however, an adjustable height boot floor, which provides storage that's perfect for charging cables, although there's not much further room below that, though. You'll get bag hooks on either side and an LED light on the left, but only two tie-down points. And you can't stash the parcel shelf against the back of the rear bench when it's not in use, as you can with some rivals. That bench has a conventional 60-40 split, but at least if you position the cargo floor at its higher level, there's no step up to it when the rear seat's folded. That releases up to 1,105 litres of room in a combustion mocha or up to 1,060 litres in this mocha E.
So how much might you pay for a little crossover that looks like this? Well, from launch, Vauxhall was asking for a sum in the 22 to £31,000 bracket for combustion versions of this car. If you're burning fossil fuel in your Mokka, you'll be offered a choice of SE Edition, SRI Premium, Elite Edition, Elite Premium and Ultimate Trim Levels. This particular variant though is the all-electric Mokka E model, so it's obviously quite a bit pricier. From launch, the brand wanted sums in the 29,500 to 30,500 bracket for a Mokka E. Uh, that's after deduction of the government £1,500 plug-in car grant. The Mokka E trim range is only fractionally different. It starts with SE and then progresses to the SRI variant and the Elite variant we have here before culminating with Ultimate. We have a specific film on the Mokka E if you want to view that, but here we're looking at the Mokka range as a whole, including all the combustion engine models, which will, after all, account for the vast majority of sales. With these, the core power plant is the brand's usual 1.2-litre, three-cylinder petrol turbo unit, available either with 100 PS or for £1,200 more with 130 PS. Opt for the higher output and you'll have the opportunity to find £1,640 more for automatic transmission. Now hardly anyone in this Mokka's market will want a diesel, but for the few that do, the brand's familiar 1.5 litre Turbo D unit is available in 110 PS manual form. Uh, that commands a £600 premium over the 1.2 litre 130 PS petrol model. All the engine and transmission combinations uh, that we just mentioned are available with the three core middle trim levels, but your petrol options, uh, they'll be restricted with the SE Edition variant at the foot of the range to the base 1.2 litre 100 PS unit, or at the top of the lineup where Ultimate Spec, that restricts petrol folk to a 1.2 litre 130 PS automatic model. OK, let's position this car in Vauxhall's own lineup for you. It's fair enough to question why, given the existence of this car, the brand continues to also offer its Crossland small SUV in this segment, particularly given the fact that unless you opt for SRI or Ultimate Trim, there's hardly any price difference between the two cars. The brand reckons the Crossland represents the practical choice in this class with its larger boot and, on most variants, the sliding rear bench that you can't have on this more stylized SUV. But we expect that most customers wanting a Vauxhall in this sector will play the style card and opt for a Mokka. Even if they're looking at sporty SRI premium trim, where for some reason this trendy model demands £2,000 more from you. We also want to compare this Mokka to the identically engineered Stellantis group models it competes with, the Peugeot 2008 and the DS3 Crossback. The 2008 costs about the same as this Vauxhall. Uh, the DS3 Crossback initially looks a bit pricier, but that's because there's no poverty spec trim level offered with that car. It'd probably be similarly priced with a similar spec. The other Stellantis Group brand model in the segment, the Fiat 500X, which doesn't share any of the engineering described so far, that doesn't cost much less than a Mokka. What all these figures tell us is that Stellantis isn't shy about charging for its products. The only exception when it comes to products from the group in this class is Citroen C3 Aircross, which shares its engines with this Vauxhall, but it uses the Crossland's more elderly PF1 platform. Consequently, at the time of this test, a base spec Aircross could be yours for under £18,000. But upgrade to a model with the safety features you'll find in the Mokka and the price difference narrows to under £2,000. Anyway, the summary here is that Mokka pricing is a slight cut above what you'd have to find for popular models in this sector like Nissan's Duke, Kia's Stonic and Skoda's Kamiq, which have starting prices in the £19,000 to £20,000 bracket. And maybe a thousand pounds more than you'd have to find for a Renault Capture, a Hyundai Kona, a Ford Echo Sport, or a Seat Arona. They have starting prices in the 20 to 21,000 pound bracket. For a Mokka, the figures you'll be paying are far more comparable to those that you'd have to find for crossovers in this class, like Volkswagen's T Cross and Ford's Puma. And it fractionally undercuts models like Jeep's Renegade, uh, Suzuki's Vitara Hybrid, and Mazda's CX30. You will need to be thinking £25,000 upwards for a representatively comparable Volkswagen T-Roc or Suzuki S-Cross, though. 
Of course, if you really want to save cash on a car in this segment, you really can. Although these days, Vauxhall probably wouldn't want to be lumped in with the budget brands who are vying for bargain basement pricing in this class. A Dacia Duster costs from around £14,000. A Sangyong Tivoli, that costs from around £14,500. And an MG ZS costs from around £16,000. We'll also pitch the value proposition of this all-electric Mokka E variant to you. It doesn't really target small EVs in the £25,000 to £30,000 category like the Mini Electric, the Honda E and the Mazda MX-30. They've got much smaller batteries and therefore they can travel a smaller mileage on each charge. This Vauxhall's £31,500 price starting point is slightly more than you'll pay for smaller battery variants of the Kia e Nero, the Hyundai Kona, the Nissan Leaf and the Volkswagen ID3, but they won't take you as far on a single charge either. Range is these days not an issue with the MG ZS EV, but that's a budget brand model with a starting price not that much different to this Vauxhall. And the Mokka E could save you £1,000 or so on a comparable version of its identically engineered cousins, the Peugeot E2008 and the DS3 Crossback e 10 And more than that, if your point of comparison was a BMW i3. Enough with price comparisons. Let's say you've considered all this and decided that in some form a Mokka seems to be exactly what you want. Well, if so, the deal might be sealed Vauxhall's way with a bit of generosity when it comes to the standard spec. So let's take a look at that now. All versions of this Mokka get automatic LED headlights, LED daytime running lights, LED tail lights and cruise control with a speed limiter. This is one of those models, though, that suffers a bit if you can only stretch to base level trim. With an SE Edition model, the smaller 16-inch wheels don't really fill the arches properly. Uh, you have to do without the signature contrast-coloured roof. And both the central screen and the instrument display are of the smallest 7-inch size. Uh, the central screen, though, does still have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring and a six-speaker DAB audio system. The next trim level up, Elite Edition, adds a bit more, so you get the black roof and larger 17-inch wheels, plus LED front fog lamps, rear parking sensors, adaptive cruise control, a rear view camera, auto headlamps with high beam assist, rain sensing wipers and an anti-dazzle rear view mirror, plus a bit of luxury, heat for the front seats and the steering wheel, climate control. And some extra tech too, uh, more camera safety features, we'll get to those, navigation and the Vauxhall Connect package that gives you quite a lot. First and foremost, there's an e-call system that at the press of a button, 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, will put you in touch with a trained advisor in the event of an emergency or a breakdown. And it'll automatically alert the emergency services if the airbags go off in an accident. Uh, using a downloadable My Vauxhall app, Vauxhall Connect will also give you access to live navigation services so you can plan a route in advance on your PC and then forward it to the car, saving a lot of faffing around when you get in at the start of the journey. Uh, there's also regular vehicle diagnostic info, plus the app will allow you to lock or unlock your car via your phone from wherever you are in the world. It can even let you or someone you nominate uh, access and start the car using a smartphone. All good, but Vauxhall expects a large proportion of customers to want a mid-range model. Uh, there you choose either luxury with elite premium trim or sportiness with SRI premium spec. Either way, you'll get the larger cabin screen package, which favours you with a 10-inch multimedia Navi Pro central monitor and a 12-inch digital instrument cluster. Now with these mid-range variants, there's also keyless entry, front parking sensors, uh, power folding door mirrors, an ultrasonic alarm system, and some extra safety tech too. To this, the SRI Premium model adds a sportier look and feel, and that's courtesy of larger 18-inch wheels with red inserts, uh, red profile exterior trim, dark tinted rear windows, black finishing for the grille badge on the front spoiler, alloy sports pedals, red fascia trim, a black headliner and a sports switch with engine sound enhancement. 
Basically, you get that SRI Premium Models trim tally without the red sporty bits on the top of the line Mocha Ultimate, although with the addition of leather upholstery, a massaging function for the driver's seat, an advanced park assist system that steers you into spaces, and the brand's Intellilux LED matrix headlights, which adapt their beam to road conditions and other traffic. So that covers the spec for the combustion models. As mentioned earlier, the trim options for the Mocha E variants are very similar. The only real difference is you get a bit more with the entry level version and it comes with climate control and anti dazzle rear view mirror uh, and a better standard of safety tech too. And also the Vauxhall Connect app and e-call connectivity pack that we briefed you on earlier. On to options. Uh, there aren't that many. Avoid base level trim and you'll be offered the chance to specify those Intellilux Matrix LED headlights. Otherwise though, it's all about cosmetics. Unless you want your mocker in solid jade white, you'll be needing to pay your dealer six to seven hundred pounds more for one of the two coat metallic shades. Uh, we've got the very eye-catching Mamba Green here. Uh, avoid base trim and you can also pay 300 pounds more to change the black contrast colored roof uh, from black to white or you can have the roof in red if you've chosen an SRI premium variant. Uh, bear in mind that you'll have to pay a little extra for spare wheel fitment too although you can't actually have that on the Mocha E. Via your dealer you'll also have access to an accessories range which includes dash cams, child seats, the usual protectors and mats for the cabin and boot plus towing and charging equipment and a rather expensive wireless phone charger. Right, what about safety levels? Uh, Vauxhall's performances in this area have always been reasonable, but rarely class leading, and that continues here with a four out of five star score in the Euro NCAP tests. Uh, the key thing is that the autonomous braking, forward collision alert, active safety brake system that you have to do without on mainstream versions of the brand similarly priced Crossland SUV is standard across the range here. Although with base SE edition spec, it only works at low speeds. Uh, there's also traffic sign recognition and driver attention warning, along with the usual suite of airbags, front side and curtain, a tyre pressure monitoring system, hill start assist, ice fix charge seat attachments and the e-call emergency system that we mentioned earlier. In addition, all Mocha models get ESP stability control and ABS brakes too with emergency brake assist for panic stops and those will be advertised to following motorists by flashing adaptive brake lights. Plus there's cornering brake control and that provides extra stability through the turns. If you can stretch beyond the base spec combustion model, you'll find that all the other mockers build on their safety tally with Vauxhall's Active Drive Assist Plus Pack. With that, the Active Safety Brake System works at all speeds, although unfortunately it still can't recognize cyclists. For manual models, uh, the pack includes lane departure warning with lane keep assist, but for the auto variants, which of course includes all the Mocha E models, it replaces it with a slightly more sophisticated lane positioning assistant. Now either way, if you drift away from the center of your lane, you'll get an alert and a gentle vibration through the driver's seat, followed by corrective steering. To get more, you'll have to stretch to top SRI premium or ultimate trim, which gets you side blind spot alert, which stops you from dangerously pulling out in front of another vehicle, and flank guard, which supports the driver when turning at low speeds, uh, providing a warning when there's a risk that the flank of the vehicle will collide into an obstacle, uh, like a pillar, a barrier, a wall, or another vehicle. Our flank guard consists of 12 sensors which analyze the surrounding area and warn the driver through the infotainment screen if a potential collision is detected. Small French-derived Stellantis group hatches of the modern era usually deliver a frugal WLTP rated running cost showing uh, aided by efficient engine technology and relatively lightweight. So it is here uh, aided in this case by Vauxhall's second use of the conglomerate's sophisticated CMP small car platform. 
Unlike some rivals in the compact SUV segment, the brand hasn't been able to embellish its mainstream engines with mild hybrid electrification, but the three-cylinder 1.2-litre turbo petrol unit that most will want here uh, still delivers a decent set of stats in volume 100 PS form. Uh, that's a manual uh, returning up to 51.4 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and up to 124 grams per kilometre of CO2. Now for reference, that is pretty much identical to what a rival mild hybrid powered Ford Puma can manage. Uh, the Ford's extra electrification is nullified by its additional 30 kilos of curb weight. Additional curb weight is of course the reason why an SUV will cost you more to run than a comparable Super Mini. Uh, this Mocha tips the scales add appropriately 85 kilos more than its Corsair Super Mini showroom stablemate, which sounds like a lot but doesn't actually translate into too much of a running cost downside, uh, not usually anyway. Uh, Mocha 1.2 litre turbo 100 PS variant will go just a mile less in terms of fuel consumption and put out only 6 grams per kilometre more in terms of CO2 than its direct Corsair equivalent. There is slightly more of a difference if you switch your attention to the 1.2 litre turbo 130 PS auto version that urban bound or older folk might want, which manages up to 47.1 MPG and up to 133 grams per kilometer. This for some reason being 3.3 miles per gallon and 10 grams per kilometer down on its exact Corsair equivalent. A Mokka 1.2 litre turbo 130 PS manual model that manages up to 51.4 miles per gallon and up to 123 grams per kilometre of CO2. Switch your attention to the 1.5 litre turbo D diesel variant and there's less reason to crunch the stats because few rivals in this segment now offer derivatives which drink from the black pump. Uh, but even if the competition was fierce amongst diesel powered small SUVs, you'd have to think that this Mokka would uh, be well placed to face it down thanks to a strong combined cycle fuel return of up to 65.7 miles per gallon, around 5 miles per gallon down on the Corsa, and a CO2 reading of up to 114 grams per kilometer, uh, 7 grams per kilometer down on the Corsa. Both of the combustion engines on offer are now fairly elderly power plants, but in efficiency terms, they continue to hold up well against the more modern engines offered by rivals. Uh, with the three-cylinder petrol unit, that's aided by relatively light weight and particularly low mechanical losses due to friction. The four-cylinder diesel unit, meanwhile, benefits from a three-step after-treatment system that's designed to better eliminate the four nasty pollutants that diesel units usually put out, uh, namely unburnt hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides and particulates. For some though, thinking about fuel consumption and smoke emissions will be all very yesteryear in these days of melting polar ice caps, and it's for these people that the battery-powered Mocha E full electric version of this car has been developed and that's the model that we're trying here today with its 50 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery and 100 kilowatt electric motor. Vauxhall's aim was for this EV to have a total ownership cost roughly equivalent to what you'd pay to run an automatic version of the petrol model. Well, it's some way off that right at present. Its drivetrain claims to be state-of-the-art for a small SUV, although its WLTP certified range quoted at up to 209 miles, 13 less than a Corsair E, is easily bettered by a comparably priced Volkswagen ID3 58 kWh model, which records up to 260 miles. Or if you want an SUV, buy the cheaper MG ZS EV, which has a 72 kWh battery and manages up to 273 miles. To be fair, the range of a Mokka E comfortably outshines base 39 kilowatt hour versions of the Kia E Nero and the Hyundai Kona Electric, and it's way ahead of the only slightly cheaper Mazda MX-30, which can offer a WLTP range of only 124 miles. Bear in mind that, as with all EVs, the quoted range figure will drop considerably in winter uh, or over long motorway journeys, in the case of the Mokka E to around 132 miles. You can maximize range by selecting the gearbox's lower B mode, which maximizes regenerative braking. If you are a Mokka E owner, you'll need to know that getting anywhere near to the quoted range figure will necessitate staying in the powertrain's provided eco mode, uh, activating its sport mode setting, or well, that'll reduce the range by around 10%.
What about charging times? Well, as an EV owner, it goes without saying that you'll need off-street parking and you'll need to get a wall box installed into your garage. Uh, with one of those in place, a full charge from empty will take seven and a half hours. If your property happens to have a three-phase electric supply and you pay extra, £300, including VAT, to have your Mocha E's standard 7.4 kilowatt onboard charger upgraded to 11 kilowatt spec, that charging time can be reduced to just five hours. Don't bother with the 11 kilowatt onboard charger upgrade if you haven't got a three-phase power supply at home. With a normal electricity supply, a Mocha E with that 11 kilowatt onboard charger would actually take longer to charge. Uh, charging cost effectively will require proactive use of the charging timer uh, so you can tap into off-peak electricity rates. You can activate this via either the car's center dash screen or via a special section of the My Vauxhall app. The charging timer will also be useful for preconditioning the cabin of the car before you get into it so you won't have to use valuable battery energy warming or cooling the interior before you set off. What about charging your Mocha E when you're out and about? Well, finding public chargers of any sort ought to be straightforward. The TomTom Tom navigation system will show them, or you can get more detail by bringing up the specialist Zap Map website on the center dash screen. Uh, that's via the car's standard Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring system. With a public 50 kilowatt rapid charger, the replenishment time from 15 to 80 percent is 45 minutes. If you're lucky enough to find a 100 kilowatt rapid charger, that falls to 30 minutes. If the charger in question is a 22 kilowatt accelerated public charger, then the replenishment time will vary depending on whether or not you've paid a little extra to get that upgraded 11 kilowatt onboard charger that we just mentioned. If you do that, you can reduce the five hour replenishment time with this kind of charger to three hours and 20 minutes. At the other extreme, if you happen to be somewhere where you can only charge from a domestic supply using an ordinary three pin plug and the optional three pin plug lead that costs extra with this car, uh, then the charging replenishment time would be a yawning 21 hours and 45 minutes. We reckon a typical Mocha E owner would save about £730 a year in operating expenses over what they're paid to run a comparable combustion engine model. And you won't only be saving money on energy costs, of course. Uh, driving into congestion charge zones will be free in a Mocha E, and you should also make savings on insurance and road tax. More significantly, your company benefiting kind tax rating will be pitched at 1% which is massively less than you pay for a similarly sized and powered combustion engine model, even an electrified one. To give you some perspective on that, a conventional Mocha 1.2 litre turbo 130 PS auto has an annual BIK exposure at 20% of 146 pounds and eight pence. With the same specification, the figure for a Mocha E is just five pounds 80. What else might you need to know? Uh, well, let's switch back to the combustion engine mocker models and tell you that there's the usual stop-start system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, uh, when you're stuck at the lights or when you're waiting in traffic. As a mocker owner, you can download that useful My Vauxhall app we mentioned earlier on, uh, via which you can take care of your car online and book in maintenance visits, which by the way, will be needed every year or 12,500 miles for the petrol engines and every year or 20,000 miles for the diesel. For this Mocha E, an initial garage visit is needed at 8,000 miles or after the first year of driving, whichever comes around first. Then the first scheduled service will be needed at 16,000 miles or at the two year point, uh, then every 16,000 miles or two years thereafter. Whatever Mocha variant you choose, there are of course plenty of Vauxhall outlets to choose from, so you should never be too far from one, and all will offer you prepaid servicing plans if you want one of those. Insurance ratings are reasonably comparable with other mainstream brand models in the segment. You're looking at Group 13E or 14E for the base uh, 1.2 litre 100 PS petrol unit, while the 130 PS version of the engine is rated between Groups 18E and 20D, depending on spec. The Turbo D diesel rates are between groups 14E and 16E. And finally, with this electric Mocha E model, you're looking at group 21E for SE Premium, 22E for SRI Premium and Elite Premium variants, and a group 23E for a top Ultimate model. 
Residual values across the Mocha range are stronger than you might expect for a Vauxhall. Uh, specifically, after three years and 30,000 miles of use, independent experts reckon you'd be looking at a retained value of around 48% for a combustion engine 1.2 litre turbo 100 PS petrol model, while this Mocha E is projected to retain around 53% of its value over the same period. Finally, you'll also need to know about warranties. In a class where Hyundai and Toyota offer standard five-year warranties and Kia offers a seven-year package, Vauxhall, like most of its rivals, persists with the usual three-year, 60,000-mile package that can be extended up to five years and 100,000 miles at extra cost. A year's free breakdown cover is also provided, along with a six-year anti-corrosion guarantee. On a Mocha E, the battery is covered by a separate eight-year, 100,000-mile warranty to 70% of its charge capacity. This second-generation Mocha represents a new kind of assertive identity for Vauxhall as it seeks to carve out a more distinctive volume brand niche within the PSA Group portfolio of brands. It certainly makes more of a driveway statement than its predecessor, as you'd hope it would, given that it sells at a slightly higher price point, and the engineering is at a different level to anything previously seen in a Vauxhall SUV. It's a massive step forward from the previous generation model. Yes, you could point out that the Crossland crossover model on the other side of your dealer's showroom would be more practical with its big boot and its sliding rear bench. But we think most people would rather have a mocker on their driveway. Style trumps sensibility in this segment. It always has. Now, Vauxhall hasn't always understood that, but under new ownership, the brand clearly does now. And in summary, well, no, this Mark II Mocha doesn't really bring anything very new to its segment, but customers of small crossovers aren't really looking for engineering ingenuity. Usually they want to make a pavement statement. And if that's what you think this car does, then you might find yourself liking it very much indeed. Superficial? Maybe. But this is the most eye-catching Vauxhall that we can remember. And that has to be a good thing. Yeah.